of life's journey. They've been serving the Lord a long, long time. As I knelt beside his bed, my heart was thrilled by what he said. If I go or if I say, Victory's mine. I'm a winner either way. If I go or if I say, I will still have my Jesus each passing day. I'll have a healing here below or life forever if I go. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm a winner either way. Sing this verse, verse. <laughs> I'm going to try to sing that first verse again. Something jumped in there that wasn't supposed to be there, but um, I don't know if y'all could even hear the words. It says, I love when I knew had reached the end of life's journey had been serving the Lord a long long time as I knelt by his bed my heart was thrilled at what he said if I go or if I say victory's mine I'm a If I go or if I stay, I will still have my Jesus each passing day. I'll have a healing here below or life forever. If I go, oh praise the Lord, I'm a winner either way. None of us really know about tomorrow. We must prepare to go to heaven any day. While we're here, let's trust the Lord. He'll lead us safe to our reward. And by His grace, we'll be a winner either way. I'm a winner either way, if I go or if I stay, I will still have my Jesus each passing day. I'll have a healing here below, or life forever, if I go, oh praise the Lord, I'm a winner either way. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm a winner either way. Appreciate that good song. We are a winner either way. Whichever way the Lord wants us to go, that's the way that we should go, and it'll turn out right. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 22, this morning, I'd like you to keep your Bibles open to that place when we get started. Got some things that we want to look at this morning, but I'm just going to read one verse as a text, verse 30. Ezekiel, chapter 22, and verse number 30. You know, in every generation, as you're turning... In every generation, God has called men to preach His Word. And God gives the men of God messages. We don't have, uh, we don't have a book somewhere that we get in the mail that says, Now, on this Sunday you preach this and this is your text and here's your points and 
here's the accompanying scripture, now just go, go do it. It doesn't work that way. It, it may work for some, and there may be some like that. But we have to depend on God for our messages. And it seems that down through the millennia, that when God has called a man to bring a, a, a message to a people or to a nation, He gives those men of God messages that address the issues of their day. But the miraculous thing about the Word of God is that though the issues of the day down through the years have been different, the same Word of God answers the questions and provides the solutions for the issues of that day. 600 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the prophet Ezekiel was called with a message. Now, after the dividing of the kingdom, uh, after the days of Solomon, uh, the Lord, you remember, split the kingdom in two. There were the kingdoms of the north uh, that were headquartered in Jerusalem, and then there were the kingdoms of the south uh, that were headquartered uh, in, the, I, I got it backwards, I'm sorry, in Samaria. Anyway, the, the point I'm trying to make is that the Lord would give a message most of the time to those men, either to the southern kingdom or to the northern kingdom. But in the case of the prophet Ezekiel, God gave him a message for the whole house of Israel. And if you go and study the book of Ezekiel, you'll find it three times in his prophecy, the Lord emphasizes that the message of Ezekiel was to the nation of Israel, the whole house of Israel. In chapter 37, in verse number 11, God describes the condition of of the whole nation of Israel, or the whole house of Israel. In Ezekiel 39, 25, it describes the hope of the whole house of Israel. Even the nations of the allied powers who had won the war went home licking their wounds. Their economies were destroyed. There was massive loss of life in every nation that fought in that war. And they were looking for answers. They were trying to find some peace and solace after what they deemed the war that would end all wars. President Woodrow Wilson, who was our leader in the United States during that time, made this statement. He said, America will not be redeemed materially until she is first redeemed spiritually. I find that to be our case in our day to day. Is that we as a nation like the nation of Israel are in some tough situations and we're facing some bad issues in our day. And just like God was seeking someone who would stand in the gap for the whole house of Israel, I believe the Lord speaks to us today and He's looking for someone that will stand in our land before Him with a desire in our heart and a conviction in our life to keep the wrath of God off of us. But will God find any? He found none in the nation of Israel. Why did God need a man? Why did God issue this challenge to His people? A people who we know will always have a remnant. A people who will in the end be great and victorious. Why was God looking for a man? Well, He was looking for a man back in those days for the same reason He's looking for one today. And when I use the term man... I'm not speaking just to the male of the species. I'm speaking of mankind. God's looking for men and women and young people of courage and conviction to stand in the gap that has been left in our land. What caused this gap? 
Why is God looking for a man? Because there was sin in the camp. Great sin in the camp. You see, the Bible describes that great sin in the life of the nation of Israel as a gap in the hedge. He said specifically, I'm, I'm seeking for a man that should make up the hedge. And that process is synonymous. That, that gap is, is a breach. It is a broken place in the wall that surrounded their lives. God has a wall of protection around about us. Walls of grace and walls of mercy. Walls of prayer, as the songwriter wrote. But sin causes breaches in that wall. And the danger of, of the breach in the wall is not the people of God running away, but through the breach in the wall, the enemy can come in and wreak havoc and cause destruction and leaves the people as an open prey to the enemy. My friend, sin does that in our life. It causes a breach in our life. It causes a breach in our protection. It causes a breach in the blessings of God in our life. And we need to be able to stand in that gap and make up that hedge so that the enemy does not come in. Our enemy is Satan. It was a time of sinful poverty in the nation of Israel. In the first 12 verses of chapter number 22, God, uh, through Ezekiel, describes uh, the, pot, the sinful poverty that the nation found itself in. If you'll notice with me in verse number 4, and I would like for you, if you would, to leave your mind open while I preach and consider our land as I preach this Bible this morning. I want you to notice in verse number 4, in, in the first part of it, one of the sins that Israel was guilty of was shedding innocent blood. Thou art become guilty in thy blood that thou hast shed. Shedding of innocent blood was a sin that the nation of Israel had found themselves guilty of. And since 1972 or 73, whenever Roe versus Wade was passed by our Supreme Court, the United States of America has been guilty of shedding innocent blood. Over 70 million of our citizens, think about that, over 70 million of our citizens were never given the chance to live. They were never given the chance to live their life in this God-blessed country away from them by our own hand. We sing God bless America. But how can God continue to bless a nation that sheds the blood of the innocents as if there is nothing to it? It is still a hot button issue in our government today. Abortion. Why don't they just call it what it really is? The murder of the innocents. The cold-blooded murder of the innocents. Not only were they guilty of shedding innocent blood, but if you'll return with me back to verse number 4, they were also guilty of idolatry. They said in verse 4, And hast defiled thyself in thine idols which thou hast made, and thou hast caused thy days to draw near and art come even unto thy years. Therefore have I made thee a reproach unto the heathen, and a mocking to all countries. Do you think for a second that America is not full of idolatry? 
We even have a television show called American Idol. And we place people uh, up on pedestals and uh, young people revere them and want to be like them and, and want to pattern their life after them. Anything that takes the place of the supremacy and, and, and the, the, uh, uh, the first place of Jesus Christ in anyone's life, that is an idol. I don't care if it's a ball game or if it's whatever the case may be. Anything put before Jesus Christ is, is idolatry. And they were guilty of idolatry. And the Lord said, you're so full of idolatry and you just won't repent of it. He said, that I've made this country my own people, He says, the nation of Israel. I've made them uh, a reproach unto the heathen and a mocking to all countries. You ever stop to think why nobody likes the Jewish people? Nobody likes the Jewish people, do they? They're constantly under attack. Read their history down through the ages. Josephus, if you've ever wanted to look at the works of Josephus, he was a historian of the days and he told about the iniquities of the, uh, not the iniquities, but the antiquities of the Jews, the the history of the Jewish people. They've always been hated. They've always uh, been, uh, been, been prejudiced against. But they're God's people. And one of the things I mentioned in the Sunday school class this morning to uh, the students that I had listening is that America was founded on many wonderful things like the Word of God and the home and respect for the Lord's day and respect for the Lord's house. But the thing that has kept the hand of God on our nation, I believe, down through the years of our shedding of innocent blood and our years of idolatry is that so far we have remained the friend of Israel. And I've read this Bible through from one end to the other time and again and I cannot find anywhere that God has taken away the promise He made to Abraham in Genesis 12. I'll make you a great nation. And I'll bless them that bless you, and I'll curse him that curseth thee. But I fear that we possibly could be in a generation now where our leaders may turn their back on Israel. Our Jewish citizens are being attacked on the streets of America simply because they are Jews by people who simply are Palestinians. Well, I want you to know, and this goes out across the whole world, Whoever wants to listen to me and see me on the camera, I want you to know I stand for Israel. And by the grace of God and by the blood of Jesus Christ, I'll be the friend of Israel till God takes me out of this place. I don't want to turn my back on Israel. Those are God's people. And God said, I'll curse you. I don't want to curse the God on me or on our church or on our land. But they were filled with idolatry. Verse number 8. The Bible says they despised the things of God. Thou hast despised mine holy things and hast profaned my Sabbaths. Now I know the Jewish Sabbath was on the seventh day, which is Saturday. But we worship on the Lord's day. The Lord rose on the Lord's day. The revelation was given on the Lord's day. The Bible tells us about worship on the Lord's day. In a couple of weeks, if God lets me live, I'll be 61. So I'm old enough to remember when nothing was open for business on the Lord's Day. You couldn't buy a gallon of water, a gallon of milk, or a gallon of gas on the Lord's Day. You better, you better be prepared on Saturday. Because nobody was doing business on the Lord's Day. I never seen farmers out on tractors on the Lord's Day. I never saw people out mowing yards and washing cars. I can remember when I first started seeing that and I was still lost and I said, that's wrong. That's, that's just not right. We weren't taught that way. Now the Lord's Day is no different than any other day. We have despised the things of God and we have profaned the Lord's Day by going out and doing everything but being in the house of God, worshiping Him on Sunday. Verse number 10. He says another sin that you were guilty of was the sin of sexual perversion. 
That's nothing new in our day. In verse number 10 it says, In thee have they discovered their father's nakedness. In thee have they humbled her that was set apart for pollution. Sexual perversion. God doesn't put up with it today no better than He did back in that day. Look in verse number 12. We see they were guilty of assassins and great criminal activities. In thee have they taken gifts to shed blood. Thou hast taken ursery and increase, and thou hast greedily gained of thy neighbors by extortion, and hast forgotten me, saith the Lord God. You can't hardly know who's honest and not honest anymore. Even contracts have loopholes in them. You have to be so careful. Everybody's out trying to rip somebody off. There's not a week goes by that I don't get a recording on my telephone. And it don't come from the same number. It don't even come from the same state. And I guess I could just ignore all of them. But sometimes they're missionaries. But I guess a missionary could leave a message, couldn't he? I'm helping myself here. But I get a message at least once a week. This is your final call. This is your final chance. And I want to, I want to, I, I, I hit zero. I want somebody to get on the line and say, do you really mean it? Do you really mean that's going to be the last time you're going to call me? I'll buy you a hot dog if it will be. Just quit calling me. Man, they're trying to rip people off, take advantage of people, especially our senior citizens get, get, get taken advantage of and they've gotten so slick and so crafty with their calls that it's hard to, to, to know the end from the beginning and what's real and what's not. And so Israel uh, was living in a time of sinful poverty, shedding innocent blood, idolatry, despising the Lord's day, uh, dis, uh, sexual perversion, uh, extortion, criminal activities, and shedding of blood, and forgetting God. Does that sound like any land that you know of tonight, today? It's Israel. It's documented Israel in the Word of God. But does it sound like any other country? It does. Well, who, who does it sound like? Say it loud. Sounds like us, doesn't it? Not only was it a time of sinful poverty, it was a time of severe punishments. The Bible tells us in verse number 14, God reminds Israel, you can't make it without me. He says, can thine heart endure? Or can thy hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with thee? I, the Lord, have spoken it and will do it. Where do you stand with God? The Bible, the Bible plainly talks about here that God will deal with His people. You know, over in the book of, uh, in the book of uh, Hebrews, uh, over in chapter number 4, where he talks about the, the Bible being the sword of the Spirit, it's sharper than two ed any two-edged sword to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and the barren as the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Well, the very next verse talks about that we have to deal with God. And are you prepared to deal with God? There's not a one of us in this room this morning, including me right here, that's not going to deal with God. All of us are. We're going to stand before Jesus Christ. Are you, are you prepared for that? Are you ready for that? As the Lord said, are you ready? Can your heart endure? Can your hands be strong? When you stand before me, oh, we must be right with God. Israel couldn't make it. Verse 18, if you still have your Bibles open, God reminds them that they were backslidden. Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. All they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace. They are even the dross of silver. He said you're backslidden. And they were about to feel the wrath of God. In verses 23 to 29, the rest of the text down to our text of Scripture for the message. It was a time of spiritual pollution. We see that today in our land. Spiritual 
pollution. In verse number 26, it talks about the priests were perverted. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my unholy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths and I am profaned among them. Let me tell you something. Coming to the house of God on the Lord's day, wearing the best you've got for the Lord, not your play clothes, not your ratty old work clothes, but the best you've got. It don't matter whether it's a tie and a shirt, but it's the best you've got. And you wear the best you've got. And you come to the house of God humbly and covered and decent to worship the Lord. But today, modern religion finds itself to just come as you are. Come in your old short shorts. Come in your old low cut tops. Come on in in your flip flops. And, and just come on in looking and smelling and acting and talking like the world. And, and we'll crank up the praise band. And, and we'll have us a light show. And, and we'll clap our hands and we'll feel good. And then we have left. God said that profanes Him. You bunch of narrow minded, fundamental, independent Baptists think you're better than everybody else. No, sir, you've never heard that come out of my mouth. But our God deserves the best. I believe His house ought to be the prettiest building on the street. I believe that people that come in the house of God that claim the name of Christ ought to look like somebody and act like somebody. But they say, oh, but the rock and the, the rock bands and letting them dress like they want to, well, that draws them in. I advise you, Adolf Hitler didn't have a problem drawing people in. And there wasn't one thing godly about that man. No, we ain't looking to draw a crowd. We're not looking to lower standards so, so that people will come and so we can fill up the pews. When, when, Lord help me, my mind's just slipped on me. Gideon, when Gideon had 20,000, he still only had 300 true. It don't matter to the crowd. The crowd, might don't make right. Right makes right. Lord help me, I don't know where I'm going here. The men of God, the men of God have gotten profaned and perverted with, with the Word of God in verse number 26. And then our leaders, look here, our leaders, it says, are princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. That's the people that were leading the nation of Israel. Our leaders are ministers of profit over the people. Verse 28, the prophets are liars, the Bible says. Her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken it. Oh, you got to be careful there. That's why I believe in people bringing their Bible to the house of God. Don't you dare sit out there in that congregation and take everything I say and say, well, he said it, so it must be right. No, you need to make sure I'm right. I'm accountable to God, but I'm accountable to you too. To teach and preach the Word of God right and straight. It's not always flowery. It's not always fun. It's not always a shout in time. But we need the truth. The prophets were liars. And then in verse 29, the people oppressed the poor. They oppressed the poor. That's why God needed a man. And you've already testified by your voices today that we're living in the same condition in our land today. God's still looking for one that'll stand in that, make up that hedge and stand in that gate for the land before the Lord. God's looking. God's looking for one that's willing to hedge the gap. See, there was another time, long before this, that there was another time of sinful poverty and severe punishment and spiritual pollution. It was another day in the history of Israel. It was the day when Moses had gone up to Mount Sinai to get the law. And Aaron... 
in response to the calls and the cries of the people. Aaron, you got to do something. We don't know what's happened to this man Moses. He said, well, let me have your earrings. Let me have your rings. And let me have all your gold. And they melted it down and they made that golden calf in the absence of Moses. Psalms 106 verse 23 reminds us, Therefore he said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. Did you hear what I said? The Word of God has just verified hundreds of years before Ezekiel ever wrote this, that what God was telling Ezekiel was exactly right and exactly the truth and exactly what had happened before. He said, there was a day when I was ready to destroy my people for their grievous sin. But he said, had it not been for Moses, one man, one man saved that nation. Because he determined that he would stand in that breach and he turned away the wrath of God. God's looking for a people who will will stand. Paul reminded us in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 13, "Wherefore Wherefore unto you the whole armor of God, wear the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day And having done all to stand, put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand and that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. That the Lord is looking for people of convictions, for people of compassion, for people of courage, for people who are consecrated. What happens to those who stand in the gap? Well, God stands with them. I'm not a prophet. I don't know the future. But you know, the Bible tells us that there was a group of people who were of the family of Issachar, one of the sons of Jacob. And the Bible said of those sons, there was 200 of them, that that the Bible spoke of, and it said that they had the ability to understand the times. In other words, they knew what was going on. Nobody, nobody, there was no media to pull the wool over their eyes and to make them believe this, that, or the other. They knew what was going on. And they knew knew what Israel ought to do. That was their description. And I'm trying to understand the days that we live in. But I can tell you this much. Just based, and you can take this with a grain of salt or a a quarter or whatever you want to take it with. But I believe just at looking around about us in the world in which we live. And we're seeing the styles of government and how they govern and how they deal with their people. The day's coming. May not be in my lifetime, but the day's coming when our faith and our convictions are really going to be put to the test. And if we stand true to our convictions, if we stand for this Bible, I believe we're going to suffer persecution for it. Now that day's coming. I believe. And God is still looking for someone to stand. Hearing the challenge of God and understanding the witness of Moses as recorded in the Psalms that because he stood in that breach, God withheld his wrath. I wonder who in this congregation this morning is willing to stand. Stand in the gap before the Lord. 
You say, well, what, 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 am I, what am I standing for, preacher? Well, first of all, who in here is willing to stand in the gap on behalf of your family? Who in here would like to be the one to keep the wrath of God off of your family? By your standing true to God. Doesn't matter if anybody else does. Will you stand? Will I? How about for your church? Would you be willing to stand in the gap? We'd love to see more growth. We'd love to see more people come in. We'd love to see it packed out, but not just to pack it out. I'm not looking for warm bodies. I'm looking for people to be true and faithful to God. To live for God. To stand on this book. This church was founded on this book. And we're still standing on this book today. And as long as you let me stay here, we're not going to move off of this book. But if they come in and chain our doors shut and say, you'll quit using that Bible. And you'll quit pointing your finger and calling out people's sins. If you'll just quit doing that, we'll let you come back in. Where will we be standing? In Acts chapter number 4, the council brought Peter and John in before them. And I'm just paraphrasing, but they basically said, now you fellas go out, preach, do whatever you want to do, but you're not going to mention that name Jesus anymore. Or we'll beat you and we'll imprison you. Peter made his stand. Peter said, you do whatever you think you need to do. He said, but I'm going to obey God. And he said, neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Peter said, beat me, jail me, do whatever you want to do to me. But we're going to preach in Jesus' name. He made his stand. And then, of course, we need to be standing for our nation. And we need to be standing for Israel. I've made my public declaration. I hope it goes all around the world. That little loudmouth fat man down there in Kernsville thinks he stands for Israel. Yeah. And Genesis chapter 12 is why I do. Let's stand to our feet and bow our heads. Scott? Sammy, let's sing that song. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. I'm going to open these altars to one and all this morning. If you need to be saved this morning, you've never come to Christ and trusted Him by faith, I invite you to come and take your stand for Christ today. Let Him save your soul. Let Him take you to heaven. Child of God, the days that we live in, are not going to get any better. They're going to wax worse and worse. Are we ready to stand? Make your commitment to Him today. Father, in Jesus' name, bless this congregation as we sing that old song. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus, Lord. And may the people make their stand today and say, yes, I'll stand with Christ. I'll not be ashamed. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing.